Hello, everyone. Uh, since we have participants from all around the globe, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to all. Uh, it is 7.30 p.m. here in Turkey. Our speaker joins us from uh, Washington, D.C., and it's 11.30 a.m. in the morning there. Uh, I see some familiar names joining us from the U.K. and from some other countries as well. So I'm glad to say that we have uh, a global audience here. And uh, before starting, I'd like to say a few words about the World Energy Council Turkey and these events that we are organizing. Uh, we, we are the national member committee of the World Energy Council, which was uh, established in 1923 in London. And we are acting as its Turkish branch here. And we have been conducting high-level discussion events, roundtables. Uh, we are producing knowledge and research in the energy field. And also, we are going to organize these like Monday's events fortnightly. So every two weeks on Mondays, we will host an expert from the energy industry, and we will discuss the hot topics of these days. And this is our first ever event, and we will hear from Dr. Glenn George today. I would like to thank him again for accepting to deliver this presentation and for being the first one to ever present in this series. And uh, Glenn is a partner of Bates White, a US-based consulting firm. He has been acting as an advisor and expert witness, mostly for the energy industry issues. And he has a vast knowledge and expertise in the energy industry, I would say. And he studied engineering at Cornell University, and then he completed his PhD uh, on energy economics and regulation at uh, Harvard University. And today he will deliver us a presentation on small modular reactors. He will explain us what role uh, can they play in a decarbonized future. Uh, after his presentation, we will have a Q&A session at the end. 15 or 20 minutes, whatever is left. And uh, so without taking much of his time, I would like to give the floor to Glenn. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Glenn, again, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rami, and hello to everyone. I, I very much appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to be here. Um, so I would like to share my screen. I will... Uh, it says that I have been disabled. Is it possible uh, for me to share my screen? I can yes, present I'll the just, slide deck uh, then. I've now opened it. I guess I think you can now upload your presentation. Can you try again? Ah, yes, indeed. I believe I have it. Yes, perfect. All right. Well, uh, this is my presentation. Um, I will, th there's a lot of material here. Uh, I hope to touch on the really important points um, and leave a fair amount of the material uh, for future reference. Uh, the hope is to have this distributed to all the uh, attendees so you can review uh, the slide deck in, in more detail at your uh, convenience. Um, so I would like to talk today about small modular reactors, frequently referred to in English anyway as SMRs, and the role they can play in decarbonizing the future electric power energy sector. Um, I'll start with a few, what I call a few takeaways. Um, First, uh, and, and this is sort of the conclusions up front, so you know where I'm going in the, uh, in the slide deck. Um, increasingly, SMRs um, will play a role in the non-carbon emitting part of our electric power mix globally. Um, there are certain advantages of SMRs relative to large 
nuclear power plants or NPPs as I call them. Um, mostly um, the disadvantages, they're smaller, so fixed costs are divided among a smaller uh, capacity. So that's the main downside. Uh, there's a really wide variety of technologies and I'll just scratch the surface here today um, on uh, the various technologies available. The main efforts to design, develop, license, and deploy SMRs are occurring in the UK, the US, Russia, China, Korea, Saudi Arabia, and elsewhere. Elsewhere will include uh, South, uh, I've mentioned South Korea, uh, but also Argentina, and you'll see in the next uh, bullet point, uh, including uh, Turkey, apparently. Uh, where press reports just a few weeks ago suggests that the government of Turkey is in discussions with the United States government regarding the possible deployment of anywhere up to 35 small modular reactors and 20 gigawatts electrical generating capacity. By the way, I will refer uh, to gigawatts electrical because nuclear reactors have a thermal uh, power rating which is typically three times their electrical power rating. And so the metric that really matters is the electrical power rating, but for clarity, I will call that megawatts or gigawatts electrical or GWE, as you see here. Um, there are several SMR designs that are uh, fairly mature um, and I believe commercially attractive if one believes uh, what the SMR vendors are, are saying in terms of capital cost and uh, operations and maintenance cost. And I do believe several uh, will be deployed in the near term. Um, and I, I firmly believe that SMRs need to be part of any long-term resource planning process, whether it's by a utility company or regulatory authority uh, or a national government. Um, so these are the key takeaways, uh, I hope, that the slides I will touch on in the next um, half hour or so uh, will help support some of these uh, some of these points. So here's the the outline of uh, of today's talk. And again, there's a tremendous amount of material here, and I will really just touch on the uh, the highlights. Um, so let's talk very briefly about the role of nuclear in decarbonizing the global energy mix. Um, and again, it, I will accelerate through these slides, so uh, please excuse me if, if I talk uh, to the slide a lot faster than you can possibly read the content uh, on, on the slide itself. Um, but there are close to 440 uh, nuclear reactors uh, now in operation in 30 different countries. Uh, with a number that came online in recent years and a number that are under construction. And they constitute about a third of all the low carbon electricity being generated uh, globally. The beauty of nuclear relative to wind uh, and solar renewable energy is that it's fully dispatchable. Wind and solar, though they can be paired with energy storage, they're not dispatchable in the traditional sense that a fossil fuel plant or a nuclear plant would be fully dispatchable. Sorry, Glenn, um, sorry to interrupt, but uh, are you in uh, uh, what, what slide? We're not seeing the slides, I guess. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm on slide four. I wonder why it's not, um, it, the page has not changed. Is it still showing an it's earlier just, slide? Yeah, it's, it's just on the first one still. Oh my, I, I don't know why that is. Let me try sharing again to see why this is happening. Um, I will, I will try this again. So you should see now, are the slides changing? Yes, now you're on the third, now fourth one. Okay, 
Yes, uh, I, I don't know what went wrong, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I've restarted it. So with any luck, it'll, it'll work better now. Um, so uh, the, the short story is that SMRs have really distinct advantages for certain purposes. Um, and I do believe that they'll play a really important role in the decarbonized future of electric power generation. So nuclear power uh, creates all kinds of uh, environmental value because it can be fully dispatched, uh, unlike wind and solar energy, which function only when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining. Of course, existing nuclear is almost exclusively large nuclear power plants. Um, but you can see that, and this is just for the United States, a similar story can be told in Canada, the UK, France, uh, Japan, uh, Russia, and a number of other jurisdictions, that nuclear is a really important part of the carbon-free energy mix. Um, yet, if we look historically... Glenn, um, sorry, again, Emma. I think you're on the slide five, but we still see slide four. I, I have your slides and I can see that I think you're talking about slide five, but uh, your screen still shows the fourth one. I don't know why. Uh, that's just very strange that it's not uh, not Apart sharing. The, so the reason is it's are the slides changing right now no we're still stuck in the fourth one so i'm looking at five and now six oh my it's still on uh, four. i really i don't know why this is now, now um, we see the sixth one now you can see the sixth one now, now yes now we can see i wonder if maybe i'll leave it in this view it's not the full page the full screen view, but maybe it's it works better for some reason. So, okay. um, we'll, we'll you, see if, if this you works. Just, if you just say when you move to the next one, if you just say we're going to the next one, then we'll be able to understand if if it's working or not. Okay, fantastic. So, um, the this is the sixth slide, um, and basically the story is here that really nuclear has not been increasing much for the past 15 or so years. Um, and so and going on 20 years. So that's a problem in terms of low carbon energy. I've now moved to slide seven. Has it changed? Yes, you can see it Okay, now. good, good. Okay, so maybe the problem was with full screen view. So. This may not be as, uh, as suitable to see the detail, but at least it's working. So um, the problem is that our nuclear reactor fleet globally is aging. Um, and so new nuclear plants are not being deployed. And that suggests, hmm, could small modular reactors be part of the solution to this problem? So, let's turn to SMRs and understand what SMRs are and what advantages they might have relative to large nuclear power plants. So anything under 300 megawatts electrical is called a small modular reactor. They may not be very small and they may not be very modular. So it's somewhat of a misnomer, I would say. Um, they do derive ultimately from uh, naval reactors. Uh, I, my background is uh, at the Office of Naval Reactors uh, of the United States Navy, um, which was charged uh, with designing and maintaining uh, the nuclear submarine fleet of, uh, of the United States. And naval reactors, submarine reactors, are by their very nature small, um, and therefore even the large reactors we have deployed globally ultimately derive, commercial reactors derive from naval reactors, which is say small modular reactors. So to some degree, SMRs are returning to the past of the nuclear 
uh, sector. Um, and so um, SMRs really have uh, a, a very strong fit with very specific applications. Um, things like space uh, reactors, um, remote locations, and replacement for fossil fuel plants. I, I assume everyone can see slide 10 at this stage, and I'll stop asking if it's, if it's functioning. Um, so SMRs will obviously fit some of these specialty uh, applications. Um, however, the question is, will they play a role in the mainstream uh, of nuclear power generation? Well, let's think about the advantages and disadvantages that SMRs have relative to large plants and see whether they, their advantages and disadvantages suggest uh, whether they will be deployed in large numbers in the coming decades. So why is it that large plants, large nuclear plants, have not really um, met their potential in the global energy, carbon-free energy mix? A number of, of, of different uh, reasons for that. One is there's not a lot of load growth. Um, second, setting aside uh, the past year's experience with disruptions to the global natural gas market to, due to uh, the Russian invasion, uh, invasion of Ukraine, but setting that aside, natural gas has generally been fairly affordable uh, over the past couple of decades. Um, renewables have grown tremendously and there's a real push for wind and solar and concomitantly some political opposition uh, to nuclear in places like Germany and Japan in particular, but some other countries as well. But I wanna focus on the bottom four bullet points um, because SMRs can really address these issues with large plants. One, ongoing concern regarding nuclear decommissioning and cleanup of power plant sites. Second is regulatory risk in general. Third, construction cost overrun risk. And finally, overall project economics or the levelized cost of energy. And in these four areas, I believe small modular reactors really can help address some of the roadblocks to further nuclear deployment. Um, nuclear decommissioning, so site decommissioning has really played a really big role in the public's mind as an unsolved problem or perceived to be an unsolved problem in a number of different countries, uh, including the US, the UK, Canada, um, and other jurisdictions. And because SMR designs, some of them, for example, are very, very compact, they have much lower site, uh, site impact, they may not need to be refueled for their entire life in some instances, and so some of the causes of concern for decontamination and decommissioning of sites um, are much less prominent with SMRs than large nuclear power plants. Um, there's the issue of regulatory risk. A large nuclear power plant may be a 10 or 20 billion US dollar investment, really a breathtaking uh, amount of investment. A small modular reactor may be only one tenth as much, for example. And so it's not a mega project in the same way that a large nuclear power plant is. And because of its smaller size, some of them are so-called inherently safe. You can walk away from them and not worry about any kind of radiological event. Much simpler than a large nuclear power plant. All of these attributes of small modular reactors suggest lower regulatory risk for SMRs. Um, construction cost overrun risk is a really major, major problem for large nuclear power plants. They're large, they're really complex, they're stick built, so-called, on site with a, um, with a design which may be standardized, but in reality is highly bespoke to that particular site where small modular reactors tend to be factory built, or at least they're planned to be 
uh, designed to be built in a factory in series to a, a truly identical design and dropped in as modules to um, a nuclear plant site. And so these things should reduce construction costs over on risk because uh, a developer gets to the nth of a kind from the first of a kind much faster in this sort of series production of a small modular reactor. Um, the, the track record of large plants has been rather spotty in recent years. And I, on this slide 16, address some of them, the Okaludo plant in Finland, the Flum and Vie plant in Normandy, France. Um, the VC summer plant in the United States was canceled several years ago. Uh, plant Vodal in Georgia, the state of Georgia in the United States is finally coming online uh, this year after a number of delays and cost overruns. Uh, the Oma plant uh, in Japan has now been pushed back to 2026. Um, and Hinkley Point C and, and others have uh, globally have experienced a number of cost overruns and delays. We think SMRs can help address some of these issues. Um, oddly, large nuclear power plants have undergone a negative learning curve effect uh, over the decades. And we could have an entire talk just about that. Um, but the, the belief is that small modular reactors can uh, bend this curve and push it back toward uh, a, a positive learning curve effect, um, including for construction time, not just cost, but the time to construct and bring a new plant online. Um, and the levelized cost of energy, which is really a, a very important metric of the cost. And, and again, I apologize for the level of detail on some of these slides, but uh, I urge you to go back uh, when you receive the slide deck uh, in PDF form and review the slides in, in more detail. But you can see that the cost of, a, of small modular reactors is, um, uh, of large nuclear power plants is, is not terribly um, competitive um, with uh, a lot of renewables. And the thinking is that um, a small modular reactor will be competitive. Um, and here uh, on this uh, slide, uh, there is a, um, a very strong, uh, and, and, and this SMRs are reflected in, in a number of different bars on this chart. Uh, but the idea is that um, the levelized cost of electricity for uh, an SMR is $100 per megawatt hour or less US dollars. And the thinking is that that makes it uh, truly cost competitive with, uh, with a lot of the competing sources of, uh, particularly of carbon free uh, electric power. Um, and the, the dispersion of levelized cost of energy uh, may be lower for SMRs. It's certainly um, very high. What you see on this slide 21 is the uh, levelized cost of energy uh, for um, large nuclear power plants, which is very, very uh, significant. This is a so-called long tail risk. Um, that is, that there's a small chance of a really huge uh, cost overrun. So in short, the, my belief, and I think the market belief, is that small modular reactors can address a number of the potential pitfalls of large nuclear power plants. And nonetheless, we need to keep our eyes open regarding some of the negative aspects of small modular reactors. And in particular, um, I would point out a few. One is there is some technology risk because some SMR designs are innovative and we'll turn our attention to specific SMR designs uh, over the next 15 minutes or so. Um, but they're innovative and therefore there's technology risk. Um, in addition, primarily there's a diseconomy of scale 
any fixed cost, for example, site acquisition cost, would be divided by a smaller number of megawatts and megawatt hours for a small modular reactor relative to a large nuclear power plant. Um, all that being said, there are lots of estimates out there of deployment or demand for uh, small modular reactors. Um, and this is one that was done admittedly several years ago, but one that shows really very significant demand for small modular reactors as part of the global energy mix in a, in a variety of different jurisdictions around the world. Um, so let's turn our attention for just a few minutes to different types of SMRs and then some particular SMR designs. Um, pressurized water reactors or PWRs are the dominant technology for operating uh, large nuclear power plants with boiling water reactors a distant second. Um, and this is just for operating plants. Um, now that said, it's true, many SMRs are uh, pressurized water reactor designs. However, there's a really, on this slide 27, you'll see a very, very wide variety of, uh, of SMR designs, not just pressurized water reactors and boiling water reactors, but um, multiple different designs, fast breeder reactors, high temperature gas cooled reactors, which are HTGRs, lead cooled fast reactors or LFRs, um, of course, we've already talked about light water reactors, they're pressurized water reactors and boiling water reactors, but molten salt reactors or MSRs, um, sodium cooled fast reactors or SFRs, and finally a traveling wave reactor design, uh, SMR design is being uh, touted. So there is, there's a lot of variety in the uh, SMR designs that are out there. Um, and let's touch on a few of them. Uh, the fast breeder reactor, um, the GE Hitachi uh, Super Prism design is, uh, is one of them, uh, a fast breeder reactor design. There are lots of high temperature gas cooled um, small modular reactor designs. And there are six of them I list on, on this page. Um, and again, I've crammed a lot of content into, uh, into the slide deck, so I apologize for blowing through these slides so quickly, but a lot of the uh, SMR designs are uh, high temperature gas cooled reactors. And the higher the, uh, the working fluid temperature, uh, the higher the potential um, Corneau efficiency of the thermal cycle attached to it. Um, and so, it's the, the theoretical efficiency of the overall power plant design goes up with the temperature of the working fluid. So there's a real premium on uh, having a higher temperature working fluid. Um, hence, HTGR designs are legion among uh, SMRs. Um, a number are lead-cooled fast reactors, uh, which was a very popular uh, Russian uh, naval nuclear design, which is now being um, turned into a commercial SMR design. Um, several molten salt reactor designs here on slide 31, I, I list four of them. Um, very, uh, I think, innovative uh, designs in this molten salt reactor uh, type. Uh, of course, there are plenty of light water reactors, uh, BWRs, um, including two different Russian uh, designs and a GE Hitachi design, uh, the BWRX 300, uh, which is a very um, simplified and smaller version of uh, the existing BWR boiling water reactor technology used in a number of different jurisdictions. Um, and of course, pressurized water reactors are, uh, have built, because they're so common uh, in deployment and they're large form globally, the SMR version of pressurized water reactors, um, there are many, many of them competing uh, right now for attention. With the leading one, I think, in my view, uh, is one from New Scale, uh, but there are multiple others uh, out there. Uh, I list four on this slide, 33, 
uh, six more on slide 34, including um, a French design, Japanese design, a couple of Russian designs. Um, and then finally, six more on this, uh, on this slide, um, including a uh, Korean design um, and a Chinese design and another uh, American design from a company called Holtec. Uh, so a lot of different uh, PWR designs. Um, there's also a uh, sodium uh, cooled fast reactor design, uh, the natrium um, being uh, pulled together by Terra Power and GE Hitachi. Um, and very innovatively, uh, there's the Terra Power uh, traveling wave reactor uh, design, very small uh, design, uh, but one which um, would uh, allow a traveling wave to uh, go through the reactor core over a period of years, um, very slowly cooling, uh, burning uh, through the uh, fissile material in the core. Very, very innovative uh, design, uh, avoiding a, uh, a lot of refueling uh, outages over a period of years. Um, so those are very wide variety of, uh, of designs out there. Uh, a few of them I, I listed as we went through in recent slides in red, and I wanted to zoom in for just a few minutes on those what I, what I call promising SMR designs um, in a little more detail. And again, I apologize for the uh, rapidity with which I need to go through them uh, in today's presentation. But the IAEA uh, has suggested uh, several different SMRs are the likeliest candidates for near-term deployment. And I've circled the ones that I, in particular, uh, believe are, are noteworthy, attention-worthy, uh, with these red circles here. The SMR-160, the TerraPower, BWRX-300, Karam Smart, ACP-100, New Scale, and Natrium are the ones I think especially worthy of, um, of attention. So let's spend just a moment again, looking at some of these and, and where they stand. Uh, the new scale Voyager so-called um, SMR design is very, uh, I think very innovative and also a leader in terms of deployment. Um, and you could see um, on this slide, again, a lot of detail here. Um, there's a plan to deploy it um, by the end of this decade um, in the U.S. state of Idaho. Um, it's received, this design received a U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, standard design certification uh, in 2022. It's a huge milestone. Um, the intent is to produce power at around 100 U.S. dollars per megawatt hour all in. Uh, which the vendor believes, New Scale Power believes, is cost competitive, uh, which it probably is over the, uh, the, the length of time measured in many decades that these reactors would be in operation. And the plan is to deploy them. Right now, there are discussions ongoing in uh, three U.S. states, Missouri, Wisconsin, and Idaho, two Canadian provinces, Ontario and Quebec, and the countries of the Czech Republic, Ukraine, Estonia, Poland, Bulgaria, Jordan, and Kazakhstan. Really a very wide range of different jurisdictions. Um, and so there's some more detail here. I, I won't bore you with it right now, but suffice it to say that uh, New Scale has been possibly the most active uh, of the various SMR vendors uh, globally. Uh, that are out there right now. And here on slide 42, there's a fair amount of detail on the proposed project in Idaho Falls. It's a really very attractive uh, project that is being, uh, that's being put forth. There would be 12 modules totaling 924 megawatts electrical uh, in the U.S. state of uh, Idaho. Uh, very exciting, I think, uh, opportunity for new scale power. Um, the Karam 25 design has been under construction for years in Argentina, interestingly enough. Um, and it's garnering a lot of attention uh, in recent years. And 
Um, it was construction was paused for several years, has restarted, and uh, and so that's underway. The smart design, uh, we're now on slide 45, uh, is being developed in uh, Korea, uh, which has turned out to be very uh, innovative and uh, very uh, cost efficient uh, source of large nuclear power plant uh, designs and construction expertise. And so the Koreans are, are pushing uh, forward a small modular reactor design, um, the smart design. Uh, which is a uh, an SMR uh, of PWR type, so that's exciting. Um, a company called Holtec, uh, based in the U.S. state of New Jersey, uh, is pushing uh, their design um, and has gained a fair amount of um, of traction. Um, it's a, a pressurized water reactor design, but really quite small, and uh, I do think that they've gained. Uh, a fair amount of uh, momentum for deploying uh, their design. Um, the Chinese ACP-100, uh, again, the construction was paused for, for a time during COVID. It, it restarted last year. And um, I never for a, a moment uh, doubt the ability of the uh, Chinese state-owned enterprises, nuclear and otherwise, uh, to deploy uh, innovative and effective technology, not just in China, but globally. So I think the ACP-100 could be a very potent competitor in the SMR um, world. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, in consonance with the Belt and Road Initiative, China is pushing the uh, ACP-100 throughout the Middle East and North Africa. Here's a map on slide 50 of some of the places where uh, CNNC, the Chinese nuclear company, is uh, pushing the ACP-100 design. Um, and there's some, on the, a on the uh, CNNC website, there's some very nice artist conceptions of what, uh, what it might look like um, as part of a very large uh, port complex with multiple other uh, co-sited uh, energy infrastructure. Um, Terra Power is, uh, is the brainchild of Bill Gates, the American uh, billionaire of Microsoft um, software uh, fame. And uh, Terra Power is a traveling wave reactor design, very innovative. Um, here's the, uh, the physics equation, which underlies the Terra Power design. Uh, I think it's one of the most innovative designs, um, though I think it will face some licensing challenges uh, because it is so innovative. Natrium um, is a joint venture between Terra Power and GE Hitachi. Uh, they've got a sodium cooled fast reactor, SFR design, I think very innovative. Um, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, GE Hitachi uh, also has the BWRX 300 design. Um, it's a boiling water design uh, with natural circulation. Um, and they have some, uh, they've gained some, I think, momentum in deploying theirs uh, in the United States. So we'll see how that goes uh, in the coming years. Um, and that wraps up the discussion of what I call the promising SMR designs. Um, I want to leave time, uh, at, at least 15 minutes for Q's and A's. So let me just touch on uh, design, development, and deployment efforts, um, and mostly leave these slides for future reading. Um, in short, a number of uh, different governments globally uh, are pushing SMR uh, development and deployment. I have three slides here of activities on the part of the U.S. government. Um, among other things, um, there's a very large pot of money for uh, loan guarantees, uh, which have been made available. Um, through the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, so that's very exciting. Um, I mentioned here uh, on slide 61 that Holtec, one, that is, one of the designs I mentioned a few slides ago, has applied for a seven and a half billion U.S. dollar loan guarantee for deploying the SMR 150 design. So um, when the U.S. government puts its mind to something, there's, uh, there's almost no limit to the amount of capital that can be thrown at the uh, at the problem. 
So that's exciting. The UK government uh, on a somewhat smaller scale has been very forward looking on um, SMR designs and deployment. Uh, so there are a couple of slides here regarding what the British government is doing, including a 210 uh, British pound uh, million uh, uh, UK pound grant to Rolls-Royce uh, to develop and deploy the Rolls-Royce SMR design. Not one I talked about in any detail, but another exciting one that's out there. Um, and the Chinese government uh, is also pushing uh, funding for and, and, and other regulatory and other support for deploying its SMR designs. Um, the government of Canada likewise is pushing uh, deployment of SMRs, um, including uh, an announcement uh, by Ontario Power Generation, I'm now on slide 67, um, of its plan to deploy an SMR um, at the uh, existing Darlington nuclear power plant site uh, where several can do uh, units are in operation. So a lot of activity globally. Um, you know, in short, the takeaway here is that any utility company, a regulator, a government agency um, could really, given the, the early stages we are of SMR deployment, that there's an opportunity for almost any government globally in any utility company in any vendor to play a really key role in deploying SMRs. Um, and uh, I, I like to think that different regulators and governments and utilities and vendors can develop what I call a no regrets policy to SMRs, which is understanding we need low carbon emitting sources of energy. Nuclear has long been an important part of uh, the carbon-free energy mix, and SMRs are the wave of the future, that money can be invested in considering SMRs as one of the alternatives, and without any possibility of looking back and regretting SMRs, to invest prudently in exploration of SMRs as one among many low-carbon energy sources. This, I believe, is the right approach uh, to ponder, consider, uh, and analyze SMR deployment uh, going forward. Uh, in the slide deck, I have a couple of different appendices, um, which I think are worthy of uh, a future study, but not in this context. And I do have my contact information at the, uh, at the back of the, of the slide deck. Uh, with that, I will uh, return to the, um, return to the, the uh, live uh, video feed uh, now with about uh, 14 minutes or so uh, to share. Um, and uh, I appreciate your attention. I, I was unable to see the, the chat earlier. I'm clicking, oh, I see it was regarding the, um, that was the slides. Slide. Not, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Not Thank forward. you, Glenn. Thank you for this very insightful uh, presentation. We will now collect some questions. If you have any questions, you can write to the chat panel or, or you can directly ask T. Glenn. Uh, in the meantime, I have two questions to start with. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, what, what do you think is the most important aspect for a government who wants to deploy SMRs? Is it the cost? Uh, is it the technology? Is it the lifespan? What do you think is uh, the most important portion for a government? What, what should they take into account? Are, are all of them similar? Is it just the cost analysis or is it something else there? This is the first one. And the second one is you've shown us, I think nearly more than a hundred different designs. And what I wonder is that whether are all of them going to be successful or some of them are going to prevail and we will end up with three or four different designs after five years or are we going to end up with a uh, hundred different designs? What do you think? So those are uh, great questions. So let me uh, address them in turn. So 
if, if I were a, a national um, decision maker, a government decision maker, anywhere globally, uh, I would set my site, uh, I, I would consider most strongly two or three things. One is this is a long-term uh, strategic uh, investment. And the, um, it's unclear uh, which technology will prevail. It's unclear which will be the least, uh, least cost. Um, but this is an investment in energy independence and it's an investment in low carbon energy future. And so I think a government needs to be hard nosed. I think it needs to look globally. I think it needs to examine multiple different sources of technology, uh, but it needs to think very long term about this. And, and if I think one of the lessons we've learned from uh, the global uh, environment uh, with Ukraine uh, and other issues over the past year or more, um, that energy independence, which is say having a wide variety of energy sources and vendors and supply chains and technologies is the coin of the realm. And being too dependent on any one country, any one technology, whether it's low cost or not at the moment, is short-sighted and not good for you know any country's long-term independence uh, and sovereignty and, and well-being. So it's it's a geopolitical decision more than a cost-driven or a technology-driven decision. Um, we are at the stage in SMR development. So your second question, um, which is akin to uh, automobiles around the turn of the last century, around the year. 1900 to 1910, there were literally hundreds of car companies in the United States and the United Kingdom and France and Germany and other industrialized uh, countries competing. And only a very small number of them survived to, to, to the present day. The um, you know, Mercedes-Benz in Germany and General Motors and Ford in the United States and you know, Fiat in Italy and so on and so forth. So we went from a hundred to a dozen globally, several hundred to a dozen. We will see the same thing in small modular reactors. We will, I think, see only half a dozen successful designs if we have this conversation 10 years from now. The thing is, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't tell the future. No one can tell the future. And so back to my first uh, response, response to the first question, one needs to keep a lot of, uh, as we say, irons in, in the fire. Uh, that is, look at a lot of different technologies rather than trying to pick one or one or two winners and losers. And I did see a, a question come up in the chat uh, panel about which technology uh, Turkey is, is uh, considering. I do not know uh, myself which technology it's, it's pursuing. I, all I saw was press report regarding um, the, the, the interest on the part of the government of Turkey in SMR technology. Um, and um, I've not, and so I, I don't know which technology it is other than I assume it's an American technology. So it's, you know, it may be technology generic um, or it may be the, you know, one, two, three leading uh, US technologies. Um, and so I also see in the chat panel um, some very, uh, very, very good uh, comments and questions. So, you know, the advantages and dangers and hidden costs um, on SMRs, um, you know, I think it's, they share all the downsides of uh, a big uh, nuclear reactor. So some of the, you know, if you believe the issue of nuclear waste is unsolved for large reactors, most of the small modular reactor designs, particularly the light water designs, uh, PWRs and PWRs, they don't solve that, that problem. So if you think that's a problem with big ones, the small ones have the same problem. Uh, and the small ones have another problem, which is that, again, I've, I said it twice in the presentation, the fixed costs are spread over a smaller number of megawatts uh, capacity installed. And so there's a a dist economy uh, of scale in uh, small modular reactors. Um, 
Another question I see in the uh, in the chat bar is the other applications. And I did talk about this in one of the early slides, a couple of the early slides. SMRs have fantastic uh, fits with some of the specialty applications, uh, including combined heat and power. So if you're in Siberia or Alaska, uh, somewhere really remote and cold, it's a perfect way uh, to provide combined heat and power in a remote location. Desalinization is one of the reasons that uh, Jordan and Saudi Arabia and some other countries with severe freshwater issues are looking at uh, SMRs. They are right sized for hydrogen uh, production. Pink hydrogen would come from nuclear. Uh, they're also very well suited for synthetic fuel production. So for industrial applications, I, I'm sorry if I didn't really stress that enough, they are absolutely uh, very well suited uh, to those um, kinds of applications. Um, I do see a question regarding uh, the regulatory framework for SMRs. Um, and I wish uh, I, I had a, a really positive story. I try to be upbeat about anything I talk about um, because as you know, people in the energy sector, I, I do think we need to bring a degree of, of excitement, not, not blind optimism, but just excitement about developments in our sector. Um, and I, I do think that um, a lot of work remains to be done uh, regarding regulatory uh, frameworks um, for uh, nuclear generally, but particularly for small and modular reactors. The problem is that the framework assumes that a, um, you know, each unit of a nuclear power plant is a big thing and needs to be thought of as a standalone element. So if each unit is 1000 megawatts or 1500 megawatts, it's not unreasonable for a regulator to say, oh, well, you need to get a license for each of these, a separate license for unit one and then unit two of a big nuclear power plant. Well, if you've got 10 units, small modular reactor units on a site, does it make any sense to get 10 separate licenses? I don't think so. Very little, pro honestly, not nearly the progress one would hope for has been made in reforming these regulatory frameworks to address that issue. Some progress has been made in some jurisdictions like the USA, Canada, the United Kingdom, not nearly enough. So that's a major area of activity for the next uh, five years. Um, I do see another um, question in the, um, in, this, in the chat panel regarding the uh, ecological footprint of SMRs versus the same generation capacity uh, for solar and, and so on, including required storage. I personally, I think this is the untold story of nuclear uh, carbon-free uh, generation capacity versus, we'll focus on wind and solar uh, for a moment. Of course, the problem with wind and solar is they cannot be dispatched. And so they need storage. Storage has in its, in turn, multiple problems. One is it's hard to build enough storage to go days or weeks between when the sun, and of course the sun typically will shine every day, but not necessarily every day. But you can go a very long time without significant wind. Can also go, go multiple days without significant sun. So you need a lot of storage. Well, batteries aren't that cheap yet. They're just beginning to get cheap enough, depending on the rules of the uh, of the grid. For example, in parts of the United States, like Texas, they're finally cost competitive. But still, you're only talking about one, two, three, four megawatt hours of battery storage capacity in a single uh, installation, which costs a lot of money. Um, and they're not very environmentally friendly, right? The uh, rare earth materials and lithium come from uh, politically unstable sources. In some instances, they're not very environmentally friendly. And, you know, batteries are not the, you know, th are not the poster child for low environmental impact projects. Um, but the real problem, ultimately, the, pr the scarce resource on the planet is land. 
Even countries with a lot of unused land, like the United States, fly over the United States sometime and take a look out the airplane window. Most of it is barely touched by human habitation, right? It's massive uh, disused or unused land. Certainly Russia and other countries have this, but these places are remote. And so you can't, you need to sort of power where the people are. Land is very scarce, very scarce near big cities and generate and, and transmission capacity rather very expensive, big footprints. I mean, mining copper and building towers and generation lines are ugly and they cause forest fires and they're intrusive. And wind, uh, you know, of course, wind turbines kill birds and solar panels cover farmland. I mean, Germany has policies to, to cover some of the finest farmland on the planet with, uh, with solar panels. And if you look at the number of megawatts per hectare of land covered, solar is really bad, wind is pretty bad, uh, and nuclear is great. Nuclear is very concentrated. And so I do think the ultimate scarce resource on the planet is land. And that will force us, obviously, we need to do wind and solar. Look, the, we have a, a global climate cl crisis that we're dealing with that requires being addressed. But in the longer term, land is scarce, and therefore, wind and solar have natural limits. And therefore, we need to put a big emphasis on dispatchable, non-storage requiring, non-carbon emitting power sources most notably nuclear and within nuclear small modular reactors as part of a mix with large nuclear power plants. Um, that I think addresses the questions I've seen in the, uh, in the chat bar. It is um, half past <clears throat> the hour. Um, I think in most time zones other than India where it's the top of the hour. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to stay on longer though I appreciate that, that we've come to the end of the uh, allotted time for this. Uh, but uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to give this presentation. Would love to have follow-up discussions with as many of you as would like to email me or contact me separately. Um, and again, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be, uh, be here today. Thank you, Glenn, for joining us and for the great q and session. We will make sure that everyone receives the whole presentations afterwards. And if anyone has any questions, they can contact you directly, I, I guess. And thank you for your great presentation. And thank you to all the participants here. Thank you for your great questions. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, yeah, good luck. Thanks. And see you later. Thank Bye. you all very much. Goodbye now. <laughs>